our research project focused on state sponsorship of terrorism and politics and the relationship between the U.S. state sponsor of terror list and the United States' foreign policy and political, you know, political beliefs and relations with other countries. So sort of an IR look at you know, the relationship between the United States and the states on the list of state sponsors of terror. Um, our, our theory is that um, the state sponsor of terror list has become solely political. That at one point in the history um, of this list, it was an actual indicator of sponsors, like legitimate sponsors of terrorism. Um, but states have moved away from sponsoring terrorism uh, in, in the classic traditional sense. And, and inclusion on the list today, in 2018, is more of an indication of your position in U.S. foreign policy than in than of you actually sponsoring terrorists in your territory and to travel abroad or nationally. The, the list was created as in 1979 as a response mechanism to the Iranian hostage crisis, which is the sort of quintessential state sponsor of terrorism act uh, as part of the Iranian revolution. Um, so that's where the list comes from. Yeah, so in 79, the first four on the list were Syria, Iraq, South Yemen, which isn't a country anymore, and Libya. Um, we're going to talk in our paper a lot about how um, Syria sort of defined state sponsorship. But in this presentation, we'll focus on uh, Libya and North Korea. The list in 2018, Syria stayed on the list the entire time, was never removed. Iran, Sudan, and North Korea. We'll talk about Sudan and North Korea a little bit later. Oof. Before we get into that, uh, let's just mention um, why is it important that you, why don't you want to end up on this list? If you're a country that ends up on this list, you are not uh, able to receive foreign aid and a number of other things from the international community. It's been called by some scholars sort of the um, that that list uh, makes you an outlaw in the eyes of the international community. It's the, it's the bad boys list. Yeah, so you can't, so ban on arms related exports and sales, um, controls of exports of dual use items, so items that can be used for civilian or military purposes, like you know, rocket technology, um, nuclear, biological, chemicals that could be used um, to make you know, chemical weapons, and then uh, prohibitions on economic assistance, which is a big one for some countries. Um, and then a lot of restrictions on uh, what people, leaders in that country can do with their finances and travel. Um, the original members of the list actively sponsored terrorist attacks. This handsome fellow right here is Carlos the Jackal, who's a Venezuelan communist named after Vladimir Lenin, who becomes a, a Islamist radical hijacker. So. State sponsorship emerged in sort of the intersection of the Marxist and religious waves of terrorism, which is why we see the countries that we see active in sponsorship. Um, East Germany never made the list, but Carlos the Jackal, known terrorist, known hijacker, was able to, you know, walk around freely in East Germany and, and you know, could carry a firearm, had support staff, had, you know, all of the all the accoutrement of sort of being a KGB agent, but was, um, was you know, a terrorist, basically. Um, we have some pretty clear definitions. Um, we use the Montevideo Accords definition of state, uh, defined territory that has a government and the ability to interact with other states, so a state that has international relations. Um, sponsorship, active material support, protection, or training. Uh, sponsor is different from a haven, which is a state that lacks either the capacity or motivation to get rid of terrorist elements in its country. And sponsorship, when we talk about Libya a little bit later, um, takes on a lot of different forms. So training, weapons, um, sort of free reign, and then terrorism, non-state political violence. Uh, and we looked at these consequences. So Libya, that's Muammar Gaddafi and Fidel Castro. So we sort of look at again, that intersection of those two waves of terrorism. Um, but they organized training camps for any and all ideologies and, you know, comers, people against the United States, against the West. The IRA, Irish Republican Army, ETA, the Basque separatists, 
basically any Palestinian group, Italian communists. Um, Gaddafi's personal pilot flew terrorists to wherever they wanted to go after you know a, a failed hijacking. Um, but in 2007, uh, Libya comes off the list. Uh, it was a process started in the 1990s. Libya was actually the first country to put out an Interpol warrant on Osama bin Laden. Um, but it was accelerated by invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, which is a central part of our, our, our thesis, that, that the U.S. signaled to states that sponsoring terrorism, if you were a, non, if you were, if you were a terrorist haven or a, an active sponsor of terror, that was no longer going to be tolerated. Uh, Vice President Dick Cheney said, five days after we captured Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya came forward and announced that he was going to surrender all of his nuclear materials. Now, having nuclear materials doesn't make you a sponsor of terrorism, which is something that we discussed in our definitions, but Libya also ejected terrorist groups, extradited terrorist suspects, and Gaddafi renounced terrorism. So, our, our, one of the central tenets that we have is that the global war on terror made it untenable for states to continue to sponsor terrorism. Uh, Libya was sort of a success of the original intent of the list because the sanctions that we applied, you know, ostensibly worked. Um, the sanctions got Libya to the table, uh, but it was, you know, the United States' actions following 9-11 that sort of pushed them over the edge to cooperate more. Um, do you want to talk about North Korea? Yeah. North Korea appears on the list and they... They, they're kind of our, um, I don't, I don't want to say main case study, but they're one of the uh, I, uh, main, main countries that sort of we put forward as evidence to prove our thesis because North Korea has been on the list a number of different times. Most recently, they were placed back on the list in 19, or 2017 by President Trump as a way of um, getting them to negotiate or, or um, stop their belligerence in Southeast Asia, at the very least, with their nuclear testing. They were originally played, even their original status on the list in the 80s is a question mark because they were placed there um, because they blew up a South Korean airline, private airliner, and that to us looks like a state act of uh, an, a political act rather than a terrorist act. So they are sort of the, what we say is, is uh, our, one of our main case points. Yeah. Um, you know, to, in 2008, President Bush takes North Korea off the list. North, again, like, that attack is a question mark. Is that a state attack? And we'll get to that again in a minute. But then sponsored terror in two decades and were rewarded politically for their cooperation. Um, this is one of the, the indicators to us that this is sort of a call and response to US foreign policy. Like, you do what we say, we take you off the list. Um, in the fall of 2017, President Trump put North Korea back on the list. For what? What did, he, what did North Korea do to warrant being put on the list? Um, missile tests, states are allowed to test missiles. Assassination of Kim Jong-nam, a member of the you know, leading family of North Korea, potentially, but those were, you know. Within the state. Like North Korean intelligence operatives carried that out. Um, so that doesn't meet our definition of sponsorship. Um, the hack of Sony, I, when the movie The Interview came out, again, that's sort of a cyber warfare attack. That doesn't really fit into our definition of terrorism. Um, important, it, John Bolton said that it's important to say what the truth is about the regime. And that's a, like a politically charged idea, right? Like this is a regime that is contrary to U.S. interests, that you know, doesn't take care of its citizens, that actively oppresses its citizens. But does that make them a sponsor of terror? Oh. Thanks, Allison. Appreciate it. So one last thing, wrap up. Sudan was put on in the 1990s. Um, and they're an example of sort of how it's been impossible to get off the list once you're put on. Every single mark against Sudan's record um, has justified its continued inclusion. You know, the problems in Darfur, the Lord's Resistance Army operating in Sudan, uh, the Westgate Mall attack in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, by our sort of testing definition, Sudan is likely a terrorist haven. 
that wants to get rid of terrorists but lacks the capacity to do so. And this is just, again, sort of wrap-up of our, of our main points. Do you guys have any questions or critiques, criticisms? Yes. Can you state your hypothesis one more time? Yeah, so we you know, believe that after the United States invaded Iraq and Afghanistan, it signaled to states that sponsoring terrorism was like going to be punished. And so states stopped. I think Libya stopped sponsoring terrorism. That's sort of our best example. Um, right. And we look at Iraq as sort of the uh, um, uh, turning point because we're part of that is we're saying that Saddam Hussein was very stable, a secular government, lots of things. He was a bad guy, we know all that, but he was also one of the leading uh, forces in the Middle East, and we're saying that states looked at that and went. They got Iraq, and so they are very serious about stamping out state sponsorship of terrorism. So we think that states essentially, before that point, were okay with that because the consequences weren't going to be as harsh. Yep. And so now, if you're on the list, it's because, you know, either the United States doesn't like you or it's a part of some, you know, larger strategy to negotiate or deal with you, as in North Korea's case. Anybody else? Okay, thanks.